talking today about the fall of the wise. The fall of the wise. If you're joining us online, uh, if you want the church notes that I pass out, just go to westcoastchurch.com. Look for Join Us Live. And the sermon notes here, click on that. Not only these sermon notes that are here today, but I don't know how long we've been putting them up, but there's several, several, several notes, weeks and weeks and weeks of notes that you can get for Bible studies, for your own personal study. It's just a, something that, that will help you as you go along. Today we're talking about the fall of the wise. We're going to look at King Solomon. King Solomon in his day was the wisest man in all of the world, in all of the earth. But I want to tell you something. No matter how strong you become, no matter how wise you are, if you're not careful, you can fall. Nobody grows beyond the potential of a fall. Did you hear what I just said? Nobody grows beyond their potential for a fall. That's how come we have to continually humble ourselves before God, continually read His Word, continually develop a life of prayer. Just not pray when you're at church, but develop a life of prayer that your life depends upon prayer for its existence. And it's so important. It's so important. Once a week won't get it for you. It really won't. It'll probably just be enough to make you miserable. It's like real cream religion. You young people won't know a thing about what I'm talking about. But real cream used to be a hair stuff, hair tonic, you know, and it was, you'd put on there and yeah, put on there, and the theme was a little dab do ya, you know, uh, a little dab do ya. Some people have this real cream religion, a little dab do it will not do you good. I can tell you that right now. Uh, so, so let's look. You never grow beyond your, the, your potential and possibility of a fall. Let's read from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. I paraphrased it here a little bit. Here we go. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And he said, ask for anything. Now, God appears to Solomon in that dream. He says, ask for whatever you want. Ask for, what would you ask for today? Oh, I, man, I, I want a new house, a new car. What would you really ask for? Well, let's see what he asked for. Um, ask for anything you want. Solomon said, Lord, you have made your servant king, but I'm a child. I do not know how to do my duties. This, you've given me a job that's way beyond my ability to do it. Therefore, give me an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. Then God said to Solomon, because you have asked for wisdom and not long life, nor riches, nor the life of your enemies, but you've asked for understanding to discern justice, I have also given you what you've not asked for. Sometimes what you don't ask for is just as important as the things you do ask for. He said, both riches and honor so that there shall not be among you, anyone like you, among the kings all of your days. In other words, you're going to be a special, unique person. None is going to be like you in all of the world. If you read his book of Proverbs, how many has read the book of Proverbs? Uh, there's 31 chapters in that book. I just encourage you to read a chapter a month. Um, let's talk about Solomon's life. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 3. And I'm going to talk about the fall of the wise. That's the title of this message, the fall of the wise. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is deviation. Say that word with me. Deviation. Say it one more time. Deviation. deviation. Um, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh and married his daughter, which was a commandment strictly forbidden by God. If you go back into the Old Testament scriptures and you look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 17, it's way before the period of the kings. And, and before the period of the judges, God had already purposed and, in, and had an intention that he was going to raise up kings. It was going to come that day. And he already, in Deuteronomy, which was written about 500 years before the kings began to appear, God had already prepared laws and rules and guidelines for how they should reign. So when you go back there and read that, you'll see that God told them not to marry pagan people. So 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh and married his daughter, a pagan lady, one that didn't serve God, didn't honor God, didn't like God, um, and it, it, was, it was a disaster, started a disaster. Here's what it says. Marriage between royal families was common practice in near ancient East because it secured peace. You know, if I, like if I, I brought your daughter into my, you know, I married your daughter and she's living in my household, it's going to be very unlikely that I'm going to attack you or you're going to attack me. And that was insurance. Because if, you, if I had your daughter and I married her and you come to attack me, the first person I'm going to kill is her. 
now it's quiet. The ladies are especially quiet, which is very unusual. But that's marriage between royal families was a common practice in the ancient Near East because it secured peace. Solomon's marital alliances resulted in peace and friendships with the surrounding nations, but they were also the beginning of his downfall. They were also the beginning of his downfall. First point I'm going to make is a little compromise is a big mistake. A little compromise is a big mistake big mistake sometimes we wouldn't even think about doing let's say I don't know if you can word it like this the big sins the big sins like adultery or fornication or what's some other big sins oh, you guys are looking at me when you said don't do that again murder covetousness hatred hating your neighbor uh, unforgiveness I mean some of us wouldn't think of doing those things. But Solomon made a little compromise, and a little compromise is a big mistake. Solomon himself said, you know, he wrote the book of Pro Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, that's a book I've never, ever really warmed up to. It's a love song. You know, it's a chick flick kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but I read it. I read it and have read it. Solomon's Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Little, fo little foxes spoil the vine and that's what I was leading up to when I said we wouldn't think of doing the big things but sometimes we'll just we'll just fluff off you guys ever use that statement I, I do use it sometimes we just fluff off the little ah oh, that's no big deal it's no big deal if I just call, gossip against Miss Nancy you know just just gossip just tell all kinds of things about her that's no big deal or is it there's no such thing as a little sin sin is sin and all of it all sin is self-destructive all sin is self-destructive to your spiritual life now thank God uh, he didn't find us in a perfect state right there's still things after I've been walking with Jesus now for over 50 years you know started in 1972 um, started walking with Jesus I was a mess <laughs> I, was real, I still am a mess but not as messy as I was <laughs> You know, but, but um, you know, all these years, Jesus has worked in me and changed me, and, and he's grown me, and he's helped me, and he'll help you too. He'll help you too. Let's, let's keep going. So a little compromise is a big mistake, and it's the little foxes that's, that spoils the vine. Now, when you, you look at Solomon in his day, and now maybe throughout history, Solomon was one of the wisest men who's ever lived, that's ever existed. And it wasn't his own wisdom. It was a gift of wisdom that God gave him. Solomon was a wise man. Just look at, read the book of Proverbs and the other one. He was a wise man, stood out in his world. Remember one of his greatest uh, things, uh, I, this is not my notes, but you remember when there were two ladies living in a house. They were both kind of like ladies of the night. Is that a good word? And, and so they both had children. You remember that? Both of them had illegitimate children. And so in the middle of the night, one of the children, I think the lady rolls over on the child and smothers it and it dies. You remember that? So both of them were in the house. So the lady rolled over and her baby died. She took her baby into the room of the other person whose baby's alive, took that living baby out and put it in her. So when they woke up next morning, the lady who sees the, and they didn't have lights in those days, they had candles and lamps. And so the lady that, whose baby was really living and stolen she, she looks at her little the little baby that's dead and her heart is broken she's whining and wailing and what would you know and then she looks and she says this is not my baby so uh, she goes I, you, I want my baby back you take this one this one and remember there's a big fight so they go into Solomon for wisdom he's sitting on his throne he's judging the people they come up and they they says the one lady says, that's my baby. She said, no, she took my baby. Her baby died. She took him out, and they're fighting, they're arguing. And Solomon said, bring me a sword. Cut the baby in half. Give them both half. Remember that? The Bible's full of exciting stories. And if you like horror flicks, Vanessa, she used to go to horror flicks. You know, a movie, I thought they were crazy. One. One is one too many, Vanessa. It's one too many. I even went in there. I said, I can't stand it. I'm getting out of here. But anyway, 
and uh, cut it in half. And the real mother cried, said, no, give it to her. And Solomon took the baby, or had his men took the baby and gave it to its real mother. Wow. Man, we need some leaders like that in our country today, don't we? Um, a little compromise is a big mistake. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Now, here's what I was going to say about Solomon. Solomon was a, a spiritually gifted person with wisdom, a gifted person with wisdom. But here's what he didn't do. He didn't live the life that he knew he should live. He really didn't. So Solomon became a great dispenser. So you can read his books and you can read his stories, and that's all wonderful, but don't do what he did. He was a great dispenser of wisdom, but he was not a great appropriator of the wisdom that he had in his life. There's a lot of people like that today. I mean, they have great wisdom. and They're dispensers, but they're not appropriators. And, and that made all the difference in the world in his life. Michael Leary, you'll see it in your notes there, said, compromise is a killer that seems to seem so innocent in the beginning. I'm just, just going to do this once. I'm just going to do this little thing. Has that ever happened to you? And then you end up, man, flat on your face. Oh, God, oh, God, you know. <laughs> How many of you done that? Yeah. Oh. The rest of you guys are liars. <laughs> You've just committed a great sin. Okay. Uh, compromise is a killer that seems so innocent in the beginning. Yet when you compromise and do a small thing, you know isn't right it rarely stays small or ends there it becomes easier and easier to choose the wrong path the next time around and that's the that's the thing about sin once you get into it it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier i remember the first time i ever used the lord's name in vain i can still remember that i wasn't churched my family wasn't churched you know at that time um uh, and I remember me and my buddies, Wayne, 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 Johnny, and Ronnie Lambeth, were, and Danny Tucker, and we lived in a little town called Frostproof. We're, we're by the Red Barn, right there by the, by the path that leads through Maxie's Grove. Y'all know where that is, don't you? Okay, there's a big red barn over here. There's this path goes through the Orange Grove, and it cuts right through the middle. You didn't have to walk around that square. Right through the middle, came out to the liquor store on the other side we're on our way to school and we're practicing new cuss words you guys ever do that we was practicing new cuss words you know uh, I can't say any of the ones that we were practicing but anyway we was practicing new cuss words and the day before there's this girl was walking in front of us and we was practicing some on them and they didn't really appreciate it a whole lot but anyway uh, this particular morning we're going to, I can still see it we're going through this grove and we're right there by the red barn and somebody one of the guys said to me hey and I don't they didn't say it like that they just said say this use the Lord's name in vain and I said I just kind of uh, I don't know there's something weird about that there was nothing churched about my family uh, I mean my dad was he was a cusser man you know mom would only cuss when dad yelled at her but and then dad would be afraid but um use the Lord's name in vain and I said I didn't want to but I said but I didn't want to be I didn't want to I wanted to fit in right so I said it I just ah and I could feel it was as though when I said that it's the first time in my life I believe that I'd ever said it as soon as I said that it was as though it was as though God was like right over me looking at me I felt weird even weirder than I feel now I felt weird and I really felt afraid but you know within a month it was a part of my vocabulary. I remember one time me and my buddy was walking by Miss Hussey. said, how would you like to have your last name Hussey? <laughs> oh, that was horrible. I guess, I don't know, because my dad used to talk about Hussey women. I don't know what that means, but anyway, I hope I didn't cuss. But anyway, I was walking by Miss Hussey's house, and her little kids were out playing in there. I'm just talking, me and Ralph. You know, we're just talking, going down the street. And I didn't think nothing about it. Later that afternoon, Ralph's going down by her house again, and Miss Hussey comes out and points her finger in his face. You tell that potty mouth brat kid friend of yours, he better never come my, by my house again, talking the way he was talking. And Ralph was telling me, I go, what did I say? It was just a part of my vocabulary then. I just said it. That's, that was me. So sometimes you think these little small sins are just, no. 
they will, they will, they will cause your conscience to grow stagnant. You can't stand to have a stagnant conscience in your life because if it does, if it becomes quiet, there's no limit to the sin that you'll involve yourself in. It's, uh, sin is a horrible thing. Uh, a little bit is never enough. It's not a little dab of do you like brew cream. Uh, a little is never enough. It's addictive. It's addictive than the greatest addiction, greatest addictive drug that there is. And, and it's dangerous, guys. It's dangerous. Okay. Com- uh, Solomon made that small compromise, but a little compromise is a big mistake. One thing I do say, and I think I've already said it, but I'll say it again, no one ever rises above the possibility of a fall. You hear what I said? I don't care how long you've been in the Lord, uh, how long you've walked with Him, nobody r- rises above the possibility of a, a fall, so guard your hearts. Guard your hearts. Above all things, the Bible says. Above all things. Above, every, above everything else. Guard your heart. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the very issues of life. The very essence of life flows from your heart. Guard it and protect it. Because if not, instead of life flowing out from you, there's going to be death flowing out from you. Maybe not physical death, but spiritual death. And you'll just be a walking nothing. That's what I was. I was a walking nothing going through life without Jesus. So... There's some more things we could say about that. I may, I may come back and say it. Second thing, you follow me in your notes? Second thing, talking about the fall of the vice, escalation. Escalation. You see that? Escalation. The first thing is deviation. When you deviate from God's plan, God's purpose, God's will for your life, when you deviate from that, then things begin to escalate. Escalate. The Bible says this. 1 Kings 11, 1 through 4. Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. He loved the one that he, the first one he had and then he married a bunch of others. He clung to them in love. He had 700 wives. 700. Oh, man. Could you imagine having 700 wives and they're all going on a shopping spree? No wonder he was so rich. I don't know, 700 wives. Most of them were wives that he had gotten from other kings and nations to, they were kind of like for treaties, for the purpose of peace. I bet he didn't have a lot of peace. Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. He clung to them in love. See, they got his heart, they got his passion. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart after other gods. It's not brought out here. I don't know if I bring it out later in the message, but but you've a lot of you guys know about Israel, right? When you go out that eastern gate, you've seen pictures of Jerusalem, and it always shows the eastern gate, which is sealed. And and the reason it's sealed because because it's sealed. Jesus prophesied of Malachi that one day, or the Bible says that one day, Jesus is going to enter through that eastern gate from the Mount of Olives. He's going to, his, foot, his feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. The, the, the mountain's going to split one side to the north, one side to the south, making a pathway for him to go about, it's about a quarter of a mile, maybe a half a mile, right up to the eastern gate from the Mount of Olives. And he's going to walk through that and claim Jerusalem as his own. It's all in the Bible. Um, so, Solomon married all these people, all these women, for, for purposes of peace. Now, these, heart, these women drew his heart away from God because of sin in his life. Because of sin in his life. Now, Jesus is coming back. We need to be ready. I, I tell you, uh, I think I'm going to live... I think I'm going to live until he does come back. And Nancy says, if I don't straighten up, I may not live that long. But I am, <laughs> I am going to try to live until Jesus comes back. All right, I had a point that I was going to make, and I let slip, let slip my mind. Let's go somewhere else. Escalation. 
what you feed grows. What you starve dies. What you feed grows. What you starve dies. I still remember sitting in the Youth with a Vision uh, living room, and Reverend Crandall Miller, Professor Crandall Miller, came in there, and he would teach us on Thursday nights, just like we go to Loving Hands and other places, and we teach right now. Bill's probably at the prison. Good place for Bill to be. Uh, Bill's at the prison <laughs> preaching, and, uh, <laughs> and if he's not in prison, he's in jail. Oh, Jesus. But anyway, <laughs> preaching. Yeah, preaching. Preaching. Uh, but I still remember being in that living room, and Brother Miller, We called, back then we called each other brother and sister, but Pastor Miller was in there, Professor Miller, and he was teaching us, what you feed grows, what you starve dies. And that is so true. That is so true. So when Solomon opened up the door with this first wife, with this first covenant, it, what you feed grows. And he had more and more and more and more and more. He prospered more and more and more and more. I mean, you can go to Israel today and see the buildings, uh, just the remains of the buildings that he built, stones that I would say would be 30 to 40 to 50 feet long, one piece of, 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 of limestone. It'd be five and six feet high stacked. They're stacked all around there. You can go underground in in, in the city of Jerusalem. You see all this? He was, he, was, he was amazing. He was prosperous and he grew. But he compromised. He compromised. And then that one compromise caused things to escalate. What you feed grows, what you starve dies. E. Stanley Jones made this statement. Whatever gets your attention gets you. You're transformed into the image of that on which you habitually concentrate. That's why you need God's Word. That's why you need to meditate on it every day. That's why you need to memorize it. That's why you need to read it. You need to study it. Why? Because what you feed grows. What you starve dies. You're transformed into the image of that on which you habitually concentrate. Association brings a simulation. So I want to associate with God's Word. I want to associate with God through prayer. And when you do that, what happens? You grow. You mature. Your heart becomes resistant towards wrong. I don't say it's, you're ever going to get to a point where you don't do wrong. Even me, I still, I mean, after 50 years, I'm still struggling to grow. Striving to grow is a better word. Striving to grow. Why? Because I need it. Because I never have grown, outgrown the possibility of a fall. And you won't either. You won't either. And so, so we, we need to do that. It's important. Uh, I, in the first service, I guess I'll do it in this one too. Um, I remember when I was in school, ninth grade, uh, when I went to high school, they started talking to us about drugs. Yeah, drugs, you know. Back then, marijuana was the big thing, and then, then acid and speed, all that other stuff. And so they, in health class, they took us to talk about the dangers of drugs, and they would talk about gateway drugs, you know, and that was, at that time, it's marijuana, a great gateway drugs, and it was a gateway because it opened up it opened up the doors for, for other things. And most of us in that class, not, I won't say most of us, a few of us, we were a minority at that time. Um, many of us had experimented already. We were smoking pot. I was 15 years old, first time I ever smoked pot in, at the drive-in theater in, in uh, Bedford, Indiana, East 50 Drive-In. It's no longer there, but the memory's there for me. Uh, Gary, one of my friends, had been in Indianapolis hanging out. He came back down. He's hanging out at the college. Come back down, and he had a bag of pot. Um, and me and him sitting, uh, sitting. I don't know what movie was on, you know, at that time, Bonnie and Clyde or something. We was watching that and smoking pot, you know. And I never smoked it before. And I just smoked it, and I was on another planet, man. It was, you know, it was, it was fun. It was good. And I've been drinking already. Uh, it was just something new. I, I, I enjoyed it. I liked it. And, but they were telling us in, in this, they were telling us in this class that it's a gateway drug. It, even if it's, you know, you're probably not going to overdose by smoking a joint. You may pass out. But, you know, uh, but I didn't believe that. I didn't believe that. Later on, I found myself, I, my drug of choice in the early days was speed. I loved it. Take, I remember one time I was in so much trouble at school. My wife looked at me and said, don't tell them stories. Okay, I got to, babe. But I remember one time in school I was in a bunch of trouble, so my mom, my mom had bottles and bottles of diet pills, which she didn't like to take because they gave her energy to work, and she didn't want to work. She wanted to watch her soap operas. Well, since she didn't take them, somebody needed to take them. They shouldn't go to waste. I took them. I weighed 140 pounds in ninth grade. I needed to lose weight. 
I took them, and it gave you energy. It, you, could, I, I, they, you could talk. I was pretty shy, you know, and, and man, I take those, and I was as bold as a lion. I remember, I remember I was in so much trouble with my principal, Dr. Abel was his name. Uh, you know, he was telling me how much trouble him and I were talking. He said, Dan, I want you to, I want you to go to my church. I think you need to go to my church, First Baptist Church in Bedford, Indiana. You need to go to my church. And I said, oh, I really do need help. You know, I really, and I've come to the point where I really, I, and I just was all talking, you know, it was a drug talk. And I, I guess he didn't recognize it. He arranged a meeting with me with this pastor to go talk with this pastor well I got unhigh and I didn't go but I felt so guilty because I should have gone I didn't that I went to church that Sunday morning sat in a Sunday school class with a bunch of classmates that that I didn't hang around with because I was I was a horrible person they wasn't Um, look gateway sin opens the door to sin little things open the door for bigger things Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issue of life. You know, and, and I got to a point where I was doing drugs and drinking and, and sex and doing everything that I could do all the time. But, you know, I got to a point where I realized that my real problem was not drugs, sex, and alcohol. It, my problem was, well, not drugs, sex, and alcohol. My problem was that it was easier for me to do wrong than it was, than it was easy, easier for me to do right and I der- derived more joy or more peace more happiness out of doing wrong than I did what was right now that, that was short lived that was short lived and uh, I almost destroyed myself I almost killed myself one night on speed but I'm not going to talk about that uh, Deuteronomy 17 so it talked about the laws of the king you must not com- you must copy of a set of these instructions read it daily and one of those commandments the king must not take many wives for himself Solomon had a thousand. When you open up the door, Benjamin Franklin, everybody know Benjamin Franklin? He said this. He said, little leaks sink big ships. Small strokes like an axe fell big oaks. Warren Wisby said, freedom does not mean that I'm able to do whatever I want to do. That's the worst kind of bondage. Freedom means I have been set free to become all that God wants me to be, to achieve all that God wants me to achieve, to enjoy all that, wants, that God wants me to enjoy. And that's the best life. When Jesus came into my life, drugs went out. Not that I didn't fall a few times on my way up, but, for, but, but drugs went out. I couldn't do that anymore. I didn't want to do that anymore. So the first point was what? Tell me. Speak back to me. First point was what? Deviation. Second point. Escalation, that is so true. If you don't remember anything else I said, remember this. Or if you've never, if, if the only sermon that you ever keep, that you ever remember that I've done, which I've done, I don't know how many. I've been here, what, 18 years? In next month, 18 years. If you don't, don't remember anything I've ever said, remember this sermon. It'll help you. The fall of the wise. Second thing was what? Escalation. The third thing, domination, domination, domination. I remember I started smoking when I was 12 years old, 12 years old. The cigarette was bigger than I was, you know, Um, and it was no big deal. I just smoked, just smoked. Um, Then I remember when I was 14, after smoking two years, when I was 14, my grandmother, she died of cancer. Uh, She had a an operable tumor in her abdomen all in this area I thought grandma was pregnant she was she was 59 years old you know and I thought she was ancient I mean older than she is now and big old tumor she looked pregnant she had to wear this thing to hold that tumor up it was inoperable and she died a horrible death and and everyone told me it was due to cigarette smoking she had smoked since she was a little girl she destroyed her life the most in the early years the most I loved her more than anyone else that I'd ever loved in my whole life my grandmother she was a great cook man oh man she, she paid attention to us but she smoked you know and so at 14 when grandma died I remember standing at her where they buried her at right by Thornton Park there 
I bet an old, old city swimming pool is not there any longer. But I remember standing by there and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. If it destroyed the person that I love, I loved her more than my mom and dad. I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to quit. And I tried. I think one time I quit for three days. Three days. And then I picked it back up. I picked it back up. You Escalation. Then what's the next thing? Domination. Such a little thing dominated my life. Alcohol was becoming the same way. And then drugs were becoming the same way. Everything was beginning to get control of my life. And I wanted to change. But I couldn't do it. The last scripture here says, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the people of Ammon. You know who Ammon and Moab were in the Bible? You know where they came from? Those two people that became leaders of great tribes? They came from a guy by the name of Lot. Do you remember Lot who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah and the angel let, let him out because Abraham interceded, interceded for him? It was Abraham's nephew. Abraham interceded for him and, and his two daughters and his wife came out, but his wife looked back and, and she died. Lot and them hid out in a cave. And his two daughters said, well, you know, two daughters got Lot drunk, had sex with him. And both of them became pregnant because they didn't want their dad to die without having an heir, you know, a male heir. And that one of them had a child by the name of Moab. And the other one had a child by the name of Ammon. Ammon and Moab, if you read through the Bibles, they became, if you read through the Bible, Wherever those names are mentioned, there's always unrighteousness. There's always war. There's always murder. There's always difficulty. Domination. Domination. 